lecture uh, featuring uh, Joe Silk. My name is Norman Murray. I'm the director of the Canadian Institute for Theater and Classical Physics, the uh, sponsors of the lectures. Um, I'm going to very briefly tell you a little bit about CETA. Uh, Normally it's known as CETA, as opposed to the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. It's an institute at the University of Toronto, but it is also a national uh, institute where uh, research in theoretical astrophysics is carried out primarily by grad, uh, postdoctoral fellows. CETA has about 25 postdoctoral fellows. There are also uh, six faculty at the seventh one is about to arrive. Uh, we're supported by the University of Toronto and uh, by the Canadian federal government to um, the NSERC, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, is a, a grant, a growing grant that CETA is supported by, and in addition by the Canadian Institute uh, for Advanced Research, or CFAR. Um, the lectures themselves are funded by a very generous grant from uh, Raymond Beverly Sackler, uh, from not quite 20 years ago now. Uh, we've had, I think, 15 lectures. Uh, teaching the most prominent uh, theoretical astrophysicists on the planet. Uh, the first two were Martin Rees and Peter Goldreich, just to give you an idea, I won't go through the whole list, it's a long list. Uh, another couple of highlights, I'll mention Andre Linde, who uh, is one of the fathers of inflation theory, which has been in the news a lot recently with the detections from the uh, bicep experiment you've probably been reading about in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Scott Tremaine, another one of the former uh, Sackler lectures, he was the first uh, director of CETA, and came back several years ago to give uh, the Sackler lecture. He's moved on since then to Princeton. Um, I should also mention, I'll introduce in just a second, the second director of CETA, Dick Bond. He's going to introduce uh, his old friend, Joe Silk. Um, uh, just before I do that, though, I just want to point out that uh, the Sackler lectures are considered uh, one of the high points of the academic year here at CETA. Uh, it plays a prominent role in the uh, life of our local academic community. And uh, I want to introduce, I mean, uh, welcome Joe, uh, and but also call up Dick Bond to uh, introduce Joe directly. Thanks, Norm. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's Sackler lecturer, Joe Silk. My association with Joe goes back to 1978 when I arrived as a postdoc in Berkeley. And where he was already a professor and one of the world's most famous uh, cosmologists back then. Obviously, Mike Fick there. He was a Berkeleyite period. Many of us uh, uh, had a fabulous period uh, in Berkeley. Uh, Joe was a graduate student at Harvard about the time the cosmic microwave background was discovered in the mid 60s. And he will forever after be associated with the rather down name called silk damping. Uh, this is a phenomenon that occurs with the first light of the universe, the cosmic microwave background, as it breaks away from being slaved by uh, interaction with matter. And uh, diffusion and viscosity cause it to damp. This is not an abstract concept. It was, over the past 15 years, shown to be absolutely spot on and correct with all of the great cosmic microwave background experiments. And silk damping is one of the ways that we learn a remarkable amount about the uh, matter content and other things of the universe. Um, but having the damping named after Joe is just so incongruous because, as you will see from the lecture today, Joe is an ex anything but a dampening spirit. He's one of the most energetic uh, beings I know in cosmology, and you'll see that today as he takes us from here to eternity. Uh, as the 70s wore on, after the silk damping, Joe turned his attention to galaxy formation, the complexities associated with that, and of star formation. And those uh, were many of the themes that he's followed subsequently in his career. Uh, some of that famous work was with one of our past, actually the very first uh, Sackler, uh, the astronomer royal Sir Martin Rees, very famous work from that period. 
To turn once again to the cosmic background radiation first light in the universe, uh, in the early 80s, doing a great work with a graduate student and a, a, a postdoc there. We had a little bit of a competitive interaction there, but we were exploring how dark matter would influence things, and that's been one of the other great themes throughout the 80s and later. Um, so, and, and Joe and I in that period, actually, we, we wrote a number of papers together. It was uh, great fun. Uh, Joe followed through with the theme of dark matter uh, up to the present, and in particular, issues of how one might detect it by what it does in space, namely it might uh, annihilate. It's a huge topic for us now, and Joe is one of the pioneers of that subject, as well as being a, a, a very uh, significant presence. Um, uh, another role uh, associated with the formation of galaxies is the huge energy outputs that come from active galactic nuclei, essentially black holes in the center of galaxies, and stars, etc. And Joe is one of the leaders in that subject that's generally called feedback. But he has done much, much more beside, and rather than try and say anything more about what he's done, maybe all I can say is that he has over 600 scientific publications putting us all to shame. Absolute, and it covers everything imaginable in the subject of cosmology and other subjects as well. Um, and the, the papers have been very influential. Most recently, Joe picked up, uh, or maybe it wasn't most recently, but it is a pretty significant thing. He picked up the Thousands Prize, prize um, that cited all of his uh, amazing accomplishments in cosmology in 2011. I like to think that the bigger prize is that we have the wisdom of making him an associate of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Cosmology and Gravity program that I'm uh, the director of, and we have many people across Canada and at the University of Toronto who are uh, involved in this. And Joe, luckily for us, quite dutifully, likes to come to our annual meetings and interact with we Canadians on matters uh, cosmological. Um, so he writes a lot of papers. But amazingly, he's also written five popular books, all of them doing quite well. The most recent is Horizons of Cosmology, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I give it a plug. Um, so apart from all of the work, Joe has mentored uh, and influence not just a generation, but generations of cosmologists because he's had a long span. And many of them are good friends of mine who have gone on themselves to uh, uh, highly influential positions. So uh, that's really maybe an even bigger legacy if you like um, having such an influence. Uh, Joe left Berkeley um, in 1999 to become civilian professor at Oxford, returning to his home country of, uh, of England. And from the, uh, at 57, but there was no sense that that was the waning, but rather the rise, the uh, further rise of Joe, because uh, from the Oxford base, he essentially conquered Europe. He already had a big network of uh, European collaborators that sort of single-handedly worked them all into a Joe network, and they covered a remarkable amount of material on, uh, on many, many different subjects. He recently uh, consolidated himself at uh, the Institut d'Astrophysique de, de Paris, um, where he spends most of his time now. He's still got Oxford connections. and uh, but. Typical of Joe, he's taken on yet another position as three months a year he's at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore um, spreading his wisdom. So a man in motion. In fact, I travel a lot, a lot of us do, but pale in comparison with Joe. Um, I attended Joe's 40th birthday in Paris, it was great fun, in uh, 1982. And then, remarkably, I was back in Paris to attend his 70th birthday in 2012. And um, I can say that Joe is such a great cosmologist that he has discovered the secret of time, which you should ask him about after his, uh, his 
presentation. Uh, and that is that he is unbelievably ageless. So as energetic now as he was in, when I first met him, and uh, no sign of abating whatsoever, as you will see tonight. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Joe Silk, a cosmologist extraordinaire. Thanks, that, that was just for really glowing words. I, I feel I don't hear it at all. Thanks, Monty. Thank you um, for the invitation to come here this week. It's, um, it's been a pleasure so far, and I'm sure it's going to be, be wonderful the rest of the week. OK, so I'm going to tell you um, the news from the frontier of cosmology, really. Um, I've given this talk a pretty dramatic title. Um, because I will be covering, you know, from the beginning to the end, um, and as you'll see, uh, there's a reasonable view that thing in cosmology that things will go on forever. But we'll come to that anyway. Um, to begin, um, this is sort of a picture of the evolution of the universe um, from a sketch, really, from its origin um, um, uh, at time very close to zero, as it were. Um, the Big Bang expands. This was been going on for some 14 billion years. Um, and uh, there was some initial very rapid expansion. And things were very hot at the beginning. And they gradually cooled down. The structure developed. And here we are today. And um, we're observing the universe in this sketch with um, the first major telescope built in Canada in 30 years. Uh, under construction, taking uh, first light in, in British Columbia. Um, it's a radio telescope, but it's designed to uncover much of uh, and refine much of what we know about the past history and recent history of the universe. Anyway, um, that's a sketch. Um, let me, uh, you know, cosmology is fascinating people for a very long time. Um, I'm not going to go back to the very beginning, but let me give you one quote. Um, from um, uh, Blaise Pascal, um, who you know made this very famous bet um, that um, he was trying to uh, justify um, uh, whether one should um, uh, believe in, in God, actually. And he realized that it was something incredibly unlikely. That, but, he, but for him, if there was the most infinitesimal probability that God would exist, um, it was worth it. And he's famous for making his wager. That's all I'm going to say about religion in this talk. Um, but um, anyway, he also regarded the universe as being an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And so he you know, said this in the 17th century. And it's very much a reflection of what we believe today. Anyway, so racing forward to the 20th century, um, um, the father of our view of our discovery of the expanding universe was Edwin Hubble, who um, painstakingly um, figured out distances to nearby galaxies and used um, a colleague's measurements of their velocities with making redshifts to realize that the further a galaxy was, the faster it seemed to be moving. And this was a figure from Hubble's original paper um, showing that you go out to, and this is roughly about 3 million light years, and each point represents a galaxy. The further you look, the faster they seem to be moving from the redshift of light in the spectrum of these galaxies. So Hubble um, published this in 1929. Now, there are two interesting bits to this story. Um, first of all, a graduate student uh, in 1926, 27, visiting Caltech, got his PhD shortly later after that. Um, in two years before Hubble, figured out that also there was an expansion of the universe. This was George Lemaitre. And he never published this diagram. And the reason was he wrote his paper in French. 
And it was, it, was, it appeared in the, it was Belgian, the Belgian proceedings of their Academy of Sciences. It was only in 1930 that um, Eddington, Arthur Eddington, discovered what Lemaitre had done, tried to persuade Lemaitre to publish his paper in, in English. And the Maitre very modestly said that because Hubble's diagram had already appeared, he wouldn't bother to publish the diagram. Anyway, it's, I think it's fair to say that, that the Maitre and Hubble should equally be credited with this discovery of the expansion. And the person, even before then, a couple of years before, actually predicted the universe should be expanding, something that was beyond um, Einstein's vision at that point, because Einstein conventionally, with others you know, at the time, thought the universe was static. Um, but the Metro realized that it was very possible and more likely it could be explained. Uh, Friedman realized that. And the Metro and, and Hubble put the data together. Well, the next thing that happened, of course, was that Einstein was convinced. You can see him and Hubble at the uh, focus of the Mount Wilson telescope, basically, um, uh, this photo for the press was Einstein's way of acknowledging that you know he was convinced that he made a big mistake. The universe really was expanding, um, and um, this was a dramatic discovery. Now, that was um, you know 80 plus years ago. What's happened <coughs> since? It's really quite amazing. Um, here is the region of space, data space, that Hubble and Lemaitre explored. This is the redshift, the fraction of the speed of light that things are moving away from us. And this is the spectral distance. And this is the expansion law. And Hubble and Lemaitre explored this very tiny region where, in reality, as we look at their data now with hindsight, we realize they should never have seen, have discovered the expansion. It was really, you know, more wishful thinking as much as anything else. It's a bit like you know going down to the beach and you see the waves and unless you stay there for a very long time, you won't realize there are there are tides. And um, it's you know so their data was very, very noisy, but the modern data you can see has this incredible uh, continuation over decades in distance out to you know billions of light years now. And the, and the latest news of course is that we're no longer we're seeing an interesting deviation from this linear from this linear relation between velocity and distance. Mean the universe is slightly accelerating. Things are moving slightly faster than they should be, far away. Distance is slightly slightly greater. We'll come to that later. So um, that is the newest thing in cosmology. Okay, going back to the history, so this was 1930 then, when the discovery of the of what began to be called the expansion of the universe. Hubble himself was not convinced that red juice meant speed. Okay? That was a whole other issue. But you know, o over the decades, the universe was expanding. There was no doubt about that. And it was realized by the nuclear physics community that there was a possibility for them to test many things that they could not do at that time um, in accelerators, which are very primitive in, 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 in the 1940s, just beginning, in fact. And so they, they, they saw that this expanding this which began to be called the Big Bang, um, um, nicknamed by Fred Hoyle, um, provided a laboratory where they could actually do nuclear physics and test ideas about element formation, chemistry, of, of where, the heavy, where all the elements came from. And the person who pioneered this story was, was George Gamow. Um, and he was a Russian emigre, uh, escaped from Russia to the US, and along with his postdoc and graduate student, he developed the idea that um, in the first minutes of the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe, the universe was incredibly hot, much like the center of the sun. And just as we now know, the sun undergoes nuclear reactions, and in fact, burns by turning hydrogen to helium. Um, he believed that the early universe would, would do that too. And in the first uh, minutes of the universe, what was people called a half an hour of creation, um, he hypothesized that hydrogen, which was the basic you know, thing he began with, the proton neutrons, would synthesize at the high temperatures to make helium. 
And it would also make some other elements too. And possibly make all the heavy elements. And the helium would make carbon, etc. Now, Gamow, in fact, um, was only partly right. He was right in, for this part that the helium, um, of which about 30% of the universe is made of helium, um, was indeed made in the first minutes of the Big Bang. And along with the helium, one made trace elements of deuterium, heavy hydrogen, and bits of lithium. And we now know that the abundances we find in the stars of these elements coincide exactly with Gamow's uh, insight with, and, and the more accurate, precise calculations that have been done with Gamow's predictions. Um, so all that works out beautifully. It turns out there's so much helium out there that it couldn't be made anywhere else. It's got to be in the, in the Big Bang. And so that, that's all very nice. What Gamow went wrong, though, was in believing that one could combine three heliums together to make carbon and therefore make all of the, all, all of the chemical elements. He was wrong because um, um, what he didn't realize was that helium is mass 4, so you add two elements of mass 4 to make mass A. Unfortunately, there is no stable element of mass A. And so it just didn't work at all. It's like climbing up a ladder with a broken rung. You'll fall down. But the, the, the new insight to that came about with um, another idea um, developed in the 1950s that in a star, um, you have enough time for three elements of helium to merge to carbon. And that way you can use stars to make the heavier elements. And you can make the very heavy elements when stars explode. And they liberate all of the other stuff they've made along the way. And we indeed are made, you know, the Earth is made, everything around us is made from the ashes of these exploding stars called supernova. So that's all, all, all very nice. And um, this was all worked out, this theory was worked out by these four astronomers, um, Margaret Burbage, Jeffrey Burbage, um, Willie Fowler, and Fred Heidel. Um, and they, um, in the 1950s, pioneered this idea that um, while the light elements were made of the Big Bang, the heavier ones, important for our chemistry, were made in stars. And um, uh, it was interesting that um, uh, some years later, the Nobel Prize is given to just one of these people, William Fowler, and the others uh, were not considered in the running for it for sociological reasons, I think, more than anything else. Um, um, being uh, you know, a female astronomer certainly didn't help, um, and these other two, Burbage and Hoyle, uh, were rather unconventional astrophysicists. They, they, um, they, they went on to do theories that were very much non-mainstream and, and very much frowned on by many of their colleagues to do with um, you know, things like the steady state theory and so, so forth, which did not turn out to be correct in the end. And maybe, we don't really know for sure, but uh, the, the award was given to Fowler for his, uh, for his participation and, and major insight in this project of the or, or, the, uh, leading to nuclear system of the heavy elements. Okay, so that, that was the period when nuclear physics reigned and was very important in cosmology. Origin of, of the chemical elements of which we made of. Um, so this was, there was the next step. It's very interesting sociologically also when you think about this. It was a community of astronomers who were just you know, busy going up mountains, taking pictures, whatever. And it was other scientists came into the field and saw the potential of what we could do with astronomy. And so nuclear physics had its reign in the 1950s. In the 1950s, the astronomers did make a major contribution, which stimulated more work later, and that was they actually discovered observationally what we now call dark matter, the fact that most of the universe is simply invisible. And the story here, um, again, it was a long battle to convince the community. Um, the first step was taken by Vera Rubin and one of her colleagues, who basically studied galaxies like this and measured the rotation of the galaxies. They measured the velocities of stars and the gas clouds as you went further out. And this depicts their velocities. And the funny thing they found was that as you move far from the center, even though you're running out of stars, all these are stars, and there are fewer stars, so you think if the stars control the mass, the speeds at which stars are orbiting should go down, gravity's weaker. That was not what, they, what, what she found, and the others found at the time, 
In fact, the velocity just kept on being the same as you went further and further away. Telling you was dark stuff that you didn't see was helping to maintain the velocities of, of the stars in, in, in their orbits. So that was, uh, she made the discovery at a time in the 1950s when women astronomers were rather rare, when she went up to do observations on Mount Palomar, there was nowhere for her to spend the night. She had to come down the next morning and spend the night at the, the, the base camp. And that was, uh, things have changed a lot since then, but those days, but nevertheless, that, that was, uh, having gone through that, she managed to uh, convince people eventually that dark matter dominated all realities. Um, even before her, um, a, another astronomer, Fritz Vicky, a Swiss-American astronomer who worked at Caltech for many years, realized that if you look at clusters of galaxies, this is a modern space telescope photograph of one, um, these galaxies, these individual spots of galaxies, would, would basically, they shouldn't be there. Their, their speeds were so large, measured by the region, they should simply be moving away. Something was holding them in place. And he realized this was dark matter. He, he invented the name dark matter. But it's only with um, um, modern telescopes that we've able, been able to make his vision of dark matter really precise. And it turns out that if you look at these images with the space telescope, with other um, uh, big ground-based telescopes, you find tiny distortions of these. These are some. There are tiny spots in which are background galaxies, the bright ones in the cluster. If you study the many, many thousands of background galaxies, you can see all these dots over here, um, and, you, and you map their distortions, then you, you actually end up with a map of dark matter, because the cluster acts like a transparent lens. The dark matter is lensing the background, distorting it. It's, it's, a poor, it's a poor lens, it gives you bad images, but you use those bad images to basically develop a map of the dark matter. So Zicky and Rubin, both were the pioneers, really, uh, two of the major pioneers. Um, you know, who had the idea that dark matter was so important. So, um, it, it, I, I gave a talk on dark matter some, I think it was about 20 years ago actually, and this is in Australia, and this was the newspaper press release uh, in a column in the paper. paper. Um, at least 90% of the mass of the university <laughs> was non luminous matter. <laughs> Retired. Okay, so I, I know that Canada is a long way ahead of Australia. Your university <laughs> has a much more transparency. Okay, right. Then, um, there was still one missing piece in this um, story, this hypothesis about the Big Bang, and that was where was the proof the universe really went through? this hot phase which did the cooking and made the helium and other light elements. And so that proof came about um, with the discovery by um, two radio astronomers who were basically mapping the Milky Way um, with a disused telescope from the Bell, at the time the Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. And they found a glow they could not understand all over the sky. And this led to the realization they were looking for the primordial fireball glow now in microwaves, um, the same sort of wavelength that you would find in your microwave oven, but basically highly redshifted, highly expanded radiation from the Big Bang. And um, much, so they discovered this in 1964. And the proof that this radiation really was from the Big Bang, um, they were pretty confident at the time, but only, it took another, um, you know, 16 years with the space, um, uh, 26 years with the space telescope, the Kobe telescope, um, when they actually measured the spectrum of this radiation okay, with incredible precision. And this is the spectrum so precise that it still um, it, it holds the record for any black body anywhere and is measured in space from the beginning of the universe, as it were. And it's the proof the universe once was a perfect furnace. And so this residual radiation, which you know, when you turn your TV set in between stations, there's this buzz on the screen. One percent of that buzz, effectively, is this background radiation from the universe. So it is there. It's, it's the leftover relic from the Big Bang. So then, um, you know, I was lucky, as, as Dick said, I, I, I did my yeah, my PhD a year after the discovery of the, of the background. It's very, it's always great to have some new idea. And my thesis advisor did not believe in it. 
which was also probably good because that forced me to, um, you know, even harder to try to argue with him. And, and eventually, I did my thesis on the uh, implications of the big wave radiation. But even then, um, uh, when I went back to Berkeley as a faculty member some years later, uh, there was still some confusion. <laughs> and so this was a letter from uh, the vice president of the university. Um, addressed to me in the astrology department. <laughs> so Campbell Hall has now been torn down. There's a new building being erected here. We'll see if it's doing better with the new building. Okay. So continuing the story of new communities enriching the field of cosmology. The next uh, big development in the field came with particle physics. And um, so in 1980s, it was beginning to be clear that you had to build incredibly large accelerators, machines, to do particle physics, to get the very high energies. And this was going to be incredibly expensive. And um, it was realized that the Big Bang, if you just took the logical implication, projecting it backwards in time, gave you these incredibly high energies naturally you would have to build an accelerator all the way to the moon, probably, to duplicate what the Big Bang could do. Um, and so, although it only happened once, that's the, the difference with making an accelerator, nevertheless, you could look at the products that came out of that and test your theories of particle physics. And so, two of the people that jumped into this and pioneered this um, development um, were um, Alan Good at MIT and Andre Lindley at Mount Stanford. And they uh, realized that um, there was one um, amazing consequence of particle physics um, that led to um, what we call the theory of inflation, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, but as you can see, uh, describing inflation is not easy. Uh, there's a lot of hand-waving involved, um, trying to describe the size of the Big Bang. And believe me, it was very, 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 very big. So let's take some things on faith here, but let's just see if I can explain a little bit of this. Okay, so this is the size of the universe before the Big Bang, approximately scale and shape. Okay, so it was certainly irregular, though we think it was the same direction as it seems to be now. And uh, this is about as far as our physics will, will, will take us. All the mass we can see compressed to this incredibly high, very dense state. Well, um, how did the universe get to be so relatively um, uh, symmetric? Um, you know, it looks much the same everywhere you look when you look, look at maps of galaxies. What is it that does this? Um, um, so this was the, um, um, the basic idea that there was a period of very, very rapid expansion. And if the universe, I'm drawing sort of a, a wrinkled balloon, really. If you imagine expanding a balloon very, very, you know, to some enormous size, all the wrinkles are slowed out. And so locally, the membrane is quite flat. Okay? And, and in three dimensions, we talk about flat space, Euclidean space. And so this is how you can convert some highly irregular thing into something very big and very smooth. And the inflation theory that then they and Goethe developed made actually three, different, three predictions. One was they could explain how big the universe was. If we went through this miraculous period of inflation, explain why that comes in a second. They could explain um, the flatness of space and the size of the universe. But also, it turned out that there was some tiny relic of these fluctuations left behind. They didn't go completely away. Uh, they were, in fact, recreated by, 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 by this inflation <coughs> process which actually provide the seeds for all the structure we see in the universe. So those were three amazing predictions anyway. So um, pictorially, again, before they invented their theory, we thought the universe was more as all we could ever see. There was no reason to think it was very much bigger. But thanks to inflation, um, there's simply no question the universe has to be incredibly big. And we can just see this, this little patch around us now. Um, but there's no telling how many more galaxies there are out there that we, we can never communicate with. It's, you know, light, this is how far light can travel, has traveled since the Big Bang, and these are so far away that, well, we can want to, to think about the future, but 
up till now, we just conjecture these, these are there. And, um, there are untold numbers, possibly even infinite numbers of objects there that we um, can probably never communicate with. So where does all this come from? Okay, so um, this is uh, an attempt to show you what particle physics has to say. So it's all a question of energy. So today we live in a very low energy universe, right? Toronto being slightly colder than the average, but whatever. Um, and as you go back in time, it was hotter and hotter. The limiting, the limiting energy you can imagine, we call the Planck scale. And it's the limit of, of, of really particle physics, where essentially gravity reaches its ultimate end, and only general relativity and gravity have to combine together somehow to get out of this mess. We call this quantum gravity, this theory which you don't understand, we don't have. And that describes what happens at, as far as we can go to the end. So this is, isn't quite time zero, but it's very, very close to zero. And this is our incomplete theory that tells us we can start from there, classical physics then takes over, and we're fairly confident what happens afterwards. What happens before, though, we just simply don't know. And this is where you know, there are many physicists doing what we call string theory to try to illustrate uh, what happened before, and there are other, other, other views about this too. But in reality, we just don't know. So there's a question mark there. But if you follow this forward in time, then um, at the very high energies, everything is, is indistinguishable. Um, it doesn't seem to matter you know, whether you're a light particle, a heavy particle, or gravity, or whatever. But once you, once you move, uh, as things cool down a bit, gravity separates, it's the weakest force of all. But left behind are the nuclear forces, the strong force that hold nucleons together, particles together and the electromagnetic forces that control the chemistry of bodies. And then as the temperature drops even more, um, those forces finally separate out, and we're left with the universe that we see now. So this is like a, a force picture uh, of the unification of forces in, in the universe. OK, and, and this is the energy at which this happened. And we understand the physics down here pretty well, because our part of accelerators, which go up to now um, thousands of GeV um, in energy, you can test this machine. So we're pretty confident all of this. And we're less confident here, but we, we know we can extrapolate. And we believe that there's an epoch here at which the nuclear reactions begin to separate from um, the other reactions, the strong reactions. So this leads to this amazing prediction about inflation, because we call these divergences of forces phase transitions. It's a bit like um, when um, um, a frozen pond melts. You get a release of energy below the surface, which helps keep fish alive in frozen ponds, in fact in the water below, below the ice. And it's this release of energy which um, was realized could be so dramatic, it could give you a sudden expansion, uh, an exponential expansion of the universe, making it very, very large in a very short time. Then things then you know, get cold and everything, then it stops when the transition's over, and things gradually resume their normal, you know, their future expansion after some spell of heating up again. Due to physics, which is not fully understood, but we that's the theory. Okay, so inflation makes things very big and also explains the, uh, the fluctuations which were produced in this transition too, and the incredible near, near Euclidean nature of space. Okay, so those are the predictions of this theory. Okay? But the question you have to ask is this, you know, you know, is this all fairy tale and how do we test any of this? Okay, so let's you know, move on to the real nitty-gritty. So um, 1992 marked a big transition in this story, um, and that was the discovery of what I call, would call the seeds of creation. And these are the tiny fluctuations that the inflation theory imprinted in the universe in density, which then caused slight temperature fluctuations in the radiation. And then as the universe cooled down, the radiation streamed to us. We see it as the microwave background, and we see tiny changes of temperature place to place on the sky. And those are discovered, uh, fully mapped, really, for the first time in um, 1992. It took, you know, again, 25 years after discovering the background to do this. Why did it take so long? Well, even <coughs> in the beginning, people were convinced there had to be fluctuations. And this shows you the history of the field, um, you know, discovery around 1964, and the observational limit was first, uh, you know, they looked at one side, the the other, said, it's as strong to 10 percent, okay, and then uh, people tried harder, and they realized it could not be perfectly smooth radiation. In other words, we simply wouldn't be here. We had to see. It's like doing fossils, you know, looking for fossils. We had to see some 
traces out there of the fluctuations. If you look back in time, uh, left in the temperature from which all the, the, the stuff that we made on eventually emerged. And it took, you know, observations got better. This is one part in a thousand. And then finally, 1992, big O, um, they managed to, 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 to strike gold. And uh, the reason it was so hard was there was all this stuff in the way. But here is what you're looking at in the universe. It's primordial fossil radiation. Here you have the galaxy, our galaxy, all sorts of dust and all sorts of mess. And you have to learn how to clean up all this. And that means going into space and doing a better job. And this sort of shows you symbolically how difficult this is. Here is a map of the, uh, of the Earth um, as viewed by the COBE satellite. Okay, so it would be just you know, on a computer, basically. And you can see, you lose uh, putting in the noise you know, in, the, in the sense of the COBE satellite, which was the satellite in 1992 discovered. And you can see, you, you have a very hard time picking out, you can't see the continents, they're there. If you analyze this on a computer, you'll, you'll, you'll reconstruct this stuff just a bit. And so when this made you know, front page news in 1992, these maps, you know, um, the, the seeds of creation, etc., this was really just noise they were looking at okay, in, in this map. But nevertheless, um, if you uh, buried inside there were the fluctuations. And this was a major discovery at that time, front page news in, in the UK, um, and uh, buried inside Le Monde in France as well. The cosmic soup. Okay, and um, this was rewarded by a Nobel Prize to the two principal investigators of the project, um, John Mather, who um, built the spectrometer that showed the perfect black body nature of this radiation, and George Smoot, who um, that built the, um, uh, the, the telescope that measured these fluctuations, etc., were as predicted in order to make structure of the universe. They had to be there and they found them. So let me fast forward now to 2013. Um, this is a story mostly of space astronomy. One could do a lot of things from the ground and from balloons. But the really major step forward has come with space astronomy, and at least until recently, come back at the moment. And so this was um, this is the story of the Planck satellite. Um, the two Prince Rescue, the shot of J and um, um, Amanda Lazy. And so this is the map of the sky seen with the Planck satellite, which had immensely better resolution than the Kobe satellite. And so this, of course, is a lot of dust. And this is the problem. You have to remove the dust. And there are, they have many frequencies. And they can do, do that subtraction. And then and this is what they found. And so there was a previous satellite um, called the WMAP satellite uh, launched uh, some six or seven years before. And this was their, their, their map. And then the Planck satellite and the this. And, and so this just compares this patch of the sky seen with two satellites. And what you notice is incredible detail. These are tiny fluctuations in temperature at the level of a few parts in 100,000, right, at the most, much smaller on, on the average. And they represent the seed fluctuations as seen in the radiation from which the density, the galaxies, everything, everything eventually emerge together. And so this is the, the map that the um, Planck satellite released uh, about a year ago. Um, so it's just, um, to some of us, this is just a thing of beauty, right? You stare at this and you can, uh, you know, you see these, uh, so these are slightly, uh, uh, blue is slightly colder, red is slightly hotter regions. Um, and these are um, the seeds of galaxy clusters and galaxies. And the empty and colder regions are where there are relative voids in the matter. And when you look at the maps of the universe, you see these things. Um, and so this, this is as close as we can get to studying our origins, really, or, um, at least uh, for the moment. And so how does this fit in with inflation? So the inflation theory uh, basically says that we have these fluctuations. They grow by gravitational effects. Kind of we call this instability, um, in which small fluctuations get bigger and bigger. And here out of these tiny seeds, you see a galaxy forming in the computer simulation. Um, and um, galaxies like this. This is one galaxy with many lumps of dark matter. It's all dark matter. But, um, the, the, and then eventually the, 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 the ordinary matter starts glowing when stars form, etc. But the, the thing about the, the, this discovery of the fluctuations is that this green line is the prediction um, of the inflation theory. Okay? Um, that the fluctuations should lie 
should basically, when the universe um, should be growing in time, starting off from some, some initial number, some tiny ripples, and because the early universe was full of radiation, it was hard for things to grow, nothing much happened, ever, but only in the late universe could things grow, and the, and the largest fluctuations had less time to grow because they suddenly appeared on the larger scales a bit later than the smaller ones. And so you, you have a very interesting picture, prediction of what the fluctuation should be. So that was the prediction. And the amazing thing is, is that if you convert this to what the satellite measured, um, the prediction line is, is the line that goes through all these points, and the data point to what the satellite measured. So this is truly amazing. I mean, you have you know, hundreds of data points measuring the fluctuations in temperature. This is just a way of measuring fluctuations, and this represents on the fluctuations on a scale of about a degree, which is where they're the largest, and you have smaller angular fluctuations, bigger ones. It's just a distribution. And this line is the inflation prediction. So the inflation model really has been well tested. Okay? And, um, and uh, it, uh, it predicted this, and this is what it's seen. So it's remarkable. But that's not all the story. So what is interesting is you notice most of the radiation comes in at about one degree or so. That's the typical strongest part of the radiation. And so here's a, another, to me, amazing test of the whole story. So here again is what they measure, things big and big. Now imagine a universe in which space was not as Euclid said. So in Euclid's space, light travels in straight lines. Okay, so here we are, we're looking back. This is where the radiation starts coming towards us from the early fireball phase of the universe. Back, this is 300,000 years after the Big Bang, where it comes to us. But if space was curved, it would not come in a straight line. The universe would act like basically a, a gravitational lens, in this case a concave lens, and instead of seeing fluctuations, you know, on some angular scale, that would be shifted to some other angular scale. So by looking at the sky, you can actually test the geometry of the universe. And that really is an amazing conclusion that's come out of this. And so you have these three possibilities for the geometry of the universe. One is like, uh, it's flat, it's three angles of a triangle that up 180 degrees. Uh, in this case, it, it's curved um, in a positive sense, the three angles that up to more. In this case, it's more like a hyperboloid, uh, the three angles add, add up to less. So those are three options of space, which Einstein's theory says are entirely possible for the expanding years of the Big Bang. And now we know that we're very, very close to this one. Uh, so it's interesting um, that this idea of curved space is something that you, are, you come across in other fields. I'm going to show you one example. Many of you may have come across the paintings of Escher. They're just remarkable paintings. And in Escher's paintings, he, he, he was able to represent the, the effects of the curvature of space. He did a series of engravings called Angels and Demons. And so you can see that uh, this represents um, um, a space in which as you go further away, the objects get smaller and smaller. So that's one effect in curved space. And that's like you know, a demagnifying lens. And if you have a magnifying lens, the opposite happens. That's when space is curved in a positive way. Um, then things get bigger and bigger. So these you find in uh, issues, issues like artwork. Quite, quite amazing, actually. OK, so that was 2013. Well, we, we are in a field where there is amazing development. OK, so let me take you to the frontier, 2014. And uh, this is an experiment that um, was done at the incredible the difficult conditions at the South Pole, um, where they um, built a, a telescope. Um, 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 Clem Pryke, John Kovacs are the two leaders of the experiment. And um, you know, it's been, on, been running, taking data for three years. Um, and they released their data just recently. And they were able to, to show that they found something. It's another test of inflation. But what they found was quite amazing because unlike the microwave background photons, which we can see back to 300,000 years after the event, what they found was the one thing that takes you back to close to the very beginning, the moment of inflation, gravity waves. So gravitational waves are the one thing, the oscillations of the gravity field from some movement of masses, you know, it's what we've been looking for in astrophysics for a long time. We haven't found them directly yet. Um, but in the Big Bang, the inflation of the universe shakes up the universe. And the one thing that can come to us from that epoch are gravity waves. And they, uh, with their experiment, looked at the microwave background, um, and they saw this polarization 
um, of the background, and this involved increasing the sensitivity from what was done on the Planck satellite by something like a thousand, instead of looking at um, you know, microkelvins, tens of microkelvins, we now are looking at tens of nanokelvins. And when you look at this incredible level of sensitivity, the radiation is distorted in a unique way that reflects gravity waves. And the only place they could have come from and left their input in the background is from 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, the moment of inflation. So it's, this is why this experiment has excited so much interest around the world and our community. OK, um, so that's another test of inflation. Uh, maybe that's the strongest test today. But something, it was a prediction of inflation, these waves should be there. OK, um, so trying to put all this together, um, we're over here. Okay, as you look back in the past, the Big Bang is out here. Okay? And so as you look back in the past, the period where um, galaxies are, and then before the galaxies formed, there are the dark ages. And then uh, this is how far you can see with the microwave background photons. Before then, the universe is opaque. It's like fog, a dense, hot fog okay, that you can't see through because the photons bounce all over the place. But thanks to the bicep to experiment, one can now, in some sense, see all the way back to very close to the beginning. Okay. So that um, is really quite an amazing feature of this. And so, again, you can see that. Um, uh, Macro background takes you to this point, 300,000 years after the Bang, and but with uh, this other experiment, we can even understand much better what happened to the beginning. Okay, so we cosmologists think that we're onto a good thing here. However, um, there is one thing that um, uh, is disturbing uh, many of us, okay, and that is it's a major discovery, a major part of the universe, but it's something we don't understand. Let me just go, I'm going to finish by telling you about the information of this. It's called dark energy, and this was discovered in 2000. And so we're, it was conjectured long before, and so this is where dark energy began. I told you that Einstein did not believe in the expanding universe, he had no reason to. He, he didn't discover it mathematically in his equation, someone else did, Friedman did. Um, so to make the universe static, which was, he had to invent something to oppose gravity in his equations, that he called the cosmos of constant. So here it is. Um, his equations of gravitation are curvature of space and as an energy source, um, which is m mass, basically. And he added um, this constant term to balance gravity, OK? And so for some given matter source or whatever, whatever balance. And so the universe could be static in principle. OK, so there was a very clever um, mathematical transformation by one of my colleagues. Um, in which he simply took his term on the left over onto the right. Okay? And now, instead of calling this Einstein's cosmic constant, um, we can now call it dark energy. It's part of the energy momentum source of the universe. But it's a weird sort of energy because it acts like anti-gravity, basically. It's going to push things. And so all this was you know, conjectured. Okay? Um, from quite, you know, over the past two decades, I would say. It was only really a decade ago that the evidence came out. And, there was, and this was the evidence that when people looked at distant galaxies, this is a supernova in a distant galaxy. And by measuring many supernovae, you know how bright these should be. And they found that, amazingly, when they looked far away, these supernovae were fainter than the other way should be, the distant ones, by about 25%, quite a lot, actually. Um, and this is because, um, what you're measuring is not just the effect of the dark matter, but it's being reduced by dark energy. Um, and so gravity basically is, um, is um, uh, not working as effectively in slowing down the universe as it should be. Um, OK. And um, so this constant term, it's a constant. It means that it only comes in as the density of the universe drops. That is. You know, in the late period of the universe. So that's why we only have begun to see in the recent universe. Okay? It's very important nearby. Um, uh, our current universe is really accelerating thanks to this, okay, we believe. And the discovery um, came from the supernova being too faint. And this, again, the discovery again was you know, 
these two gentlemen got the Nobel Prize a few, uh, a few years ago for their discovery of um, the acceleration of the universe, actually. But the notion of dark energy is a mystery. In their Nobel Prize citation, the words dark energy were not mentioned. It's acceleration of the universe. And so what on earth is causing the acceleration? Uh, this is the thing I'm going to basically um, close with, discussing this. Um, so this is a summary of um, where we are with our budget of the universe. So here is um, the, the atomic stuff that we're made of, the astronomy the galaxy. There's the dark matter, um, which is far more than the atomic matter, but we, we survey it, we measure it. We don't know what it is, that's a big issue, but we're pretty sure it's there. Um, but most of the stuff in the universe is causing this acceleration. It's caused it's dark matter, 75%. Now, here is a problem that is really taken very, very seriously by all of my colleagues. And because it's something, you know, dark matter is something we have many candidates for. Fine. Maybe too many candidates we haven't found it, but we, we think we know what it could be. For dark energy, we haven't the slightest clue. And the problem is that we have a prediction. Okay? That's this number, um, um, this number over here which just comes from what the universe was early on, 10 to the 112. And this is what we measure. And this difference, which is uh, 120 powers of 10, is, has been called the worst prediction in all the physics. Okay, so from the physics of the first instant of the universe, we think we know what this dark energy term should be, what its value should be, unless there's some very odd series of cancellations which no one has been able to figure out, <coughs> The measure, value of measure is far, far lower. So what on earth is going on? So this has led to some very intriguing ideas in cosmology. So uh, let me tell you what the solution, possible correlation solution, and that is um, we live in a multiverse where all values of lambda are possible. But if there are enough possibilities for the universe in this multiverse, then we might be just the right one, we're smaller. And so um, it turns out there is a theory of inflation called eternal inflation, um, which, um, you know, here is uh, one universe, maybe our universe over here. But all of these uh, different times, bubbles can inflate and become new universes. And this can happen again and again and again. It's very unlikely, but the universe is very big, so it's always, according to the theory, it will be happening somewhere. And this multiplication of universes then gives you the possibility of understanding why it is that almost all of these will be totally in inhabitable. They won't look like our universe. If the cosmic constant is too large, everything just gets ripped apart. You'll be, you'll be ripped apart by this acceleration. So that's a bad place to be. The galaxy will be ripped apart. So, but somewhere in that vast multiverse, there'll be a universe given the wide range of possible values of the constant. Assume they could be place to place. Um, that um, there'd be one that might be just right. And so the prime, one of the prime advocators of, of this view is um, Stanford cosmologist, Amy Susskind, who says that you know, we live um, in one tiny pocket of the universe um, where the value of the constant just consists with our kind of life. And so that's um, you know, a possible uh, solution to the problem. There are many, many, universe is pretty by inflation, and one of them might, might be okay, most would not be. Uh, the counter view is expressed by um, George Ellis, and he argues that, um, and I, I really symbolize this, that this is a theory that's impossible to test, because uh, you, you just can't make any predictions. I mean, because there's no way you can communicate with these other universes. By definition, um, you can't go to them. They're, they're outside our, our horizon, our causal region. Um, so it's a sort of theory, um, the multiverse theory, he said, can explain anything. Okay, so um, here's a quote from Lando on cosmologists, often in error, never in doubt. Okay, so what, where could we go? Okay, so I think there are two, two approaches to this, to this problem. One, one is that um, you hope that we will have a fundamental theory. If, suppose we discard the multiverse, which I, I am certainly inclined to do, as being a, a, a physics theory. <coughs> Maybe 
it's a matter of explanation, but that's another story. Um, maybe uh, there, there will be a more fundamental theory someday that we don't have yet, dark energy. Or maybe there'll be some astrophysical explanation. So I'm going to show you examples um, in closing of these two things. So here's a physics solution to the problem. So it turns out that um, if you go through the possibility of all possible universes, you can arrange them by topology. Um, by sort of, it's a bit like uh, um, you know, a, a mug with, has a handle with a loop in that's different from the topology of a tumbler which has no loop. So it's, it's some way in physics of classifying space times by their topology. Okay, anyway, so you classify all of the 10 to the power of 500 spaces that are predicted by one version of you know, the possibilities that are in place you can use all these multiple. Um, then you can you find that when you arrange them, the, the, if you go to the simplest possible topology, where what we call the Hodge number is just three, there are just three spaces left. And so this happens to coincide with the number of um, um, uh, degrees of freedom essentially you need in the standard model of particle physics. So this is the sort of way you might hope to get from something incredibly complex down to something much simpler. So that's a potential particle physics uh, route to explore. And here is the astrophysics route to explore, which I think is also not totally crazy, um, but it may seem rather absurd because it really goes back to pre Copernican views, namely, we live in a very special place in the universe. And so instead of, you know, our just being in some random place in this big, big universe, we are in the middle here of the big hole. Now, not a truly deep hole, uh, you can let your hole be 10% or something, 30% deep, whatever. But because we're in the middle of the big hole, which is about as big as most distant galaxies are seen to be, then because we're in this big hole, those galaxies will be moving away from us, you know, in, in the over density things move to us, and the hole will move away from us, and that will mimic the apparent acceleration. Okay. So um, that's another solution. Okay, maybe. Um, that has yet to be possibility that, you know, we live in a special place is something that is yet to be eliminated as, as an explanation. So. Okay, so to conclude the future, um, this is where dark matter is going. I, I think uh, we, we know it's not, not, not only matter, otherwise we'll, we'll be glowing, we'll be seeing it, it would, you know, it would not be in the other parts of galaxies, uh, it would be concentrated like the other matter is. So it's probably uh, some weak theoretical particle. Um, we haven't found it yet, but there are many experiments around the world looking in very bizarre places. So here's an experiment deep underground, um, several thousand meters underground, looking for particles of dark matter. They can plow through the earth, they're in the halo, and the one place you might find them is where um, no cosmic rays can get to, somewhere very quiescent and, 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 and calm and quiet. That happens to be in the bottom of the deep mine. Um, so detectors are being built in met, met several mines around the globe. Um, Here's a very unusual type of telescope, um, which is designed to look for um, um, nanosecond duration flickering in the atmosphere um, um, uh, called Cherenkov light bursts. And these are produced by very gamma rays, which ionize bits of the atmosphere and cause cosmic ray showers, basically. Um, and these would come from dark matter particles that, is, that are actually annihilating themselves. It's on probably dark matter that we think is a signature to find here. And another place to look for dark matter is way below the South Pole. So this is, again, 5,000 meters below the surface of the pole. How the hell do you get there? Well, you drill um, um, in the ice and immediately with hot steam, basically, under high pressure. And lower rings, uh, lines of photojuice is immediately frozen over, of course. But they can signal the effect of dark matter particles in the sun, collected by the sun, it's a big detector on the Earth, annihilating, giving you neutrinos, which then go to the Earth, high energy, and then produce, um, in the Earth, can produce muons, which then pass through the ice, and give you, again, children of light flashes. So these are looking, look, telescopes that look at the sun, essentially, so the traces of dark matter. And then finally, <coughs> telescopes in space, and the gamma rays. All of these are, possible ways to see dark matter, and every now and then we get excited because there's some possible detection, but they have not been confirmed today. Okay, and then as far as dark energy goes, that there are, um, you know, many uh, 
types of telescopes under construction now. Um, uh, there's the uh, 10 meter telescope in which Carrigan is, is playing a part. Uh, sorry, the, um, uh, this will be placed in Hawaii, um, 30 meters across. That's uh, much, you know, four times larger than the current large telescopes or so. Um, as an even larger giant being designed soon to build in to commence in um, also the southern European version of a very large telescope. Um, there's a uh, telescope in space, um, Planck already mentioned. Um, the Euclid telescope will be giving this um, exquisite map of the sky to look for dark matter, basically, and also dark energy, um, again, to be launched around 2019 or so. This, this experiment is a four meter telescope designed to do a very um, a survey of dark energy by looking at some galaxies. Again, taking data now. Um, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, um, a, few, uh, a telescope to be launched in the uh, uh, three or four years, I believe, uh, led by NASA. And then um, sequels of the um, bicep to array. Okay, so all of this will change our, our views and hopefully give us clues as to what dark energy may be. Maybe it's not exactly the constant we think it is. As far as the future of cosmology, um, here are some suggestions. Um, we need, I think, we're overdue for a new Einstein to basically take us forward in uh, fundamental theory. I think we're lacking this. Uh, we also need uh, better observations. Um, and those will be coming. Um, and we need improved uh, simulations uh, to forecast what we should be seeing. So all of these are uh, involve major efforts and, um, um, and they're being done around the world, um, apart from the new Einstein. We have to wait and see where that will come from. And as far as the future of the universe goes, well, um, here we are. Um, this is our uh, schematically our uh, 15 billion light years, whatever, that we can see with our biggest telescopes. What will it be like in the future? Well, if the universe really is accelerating now, as our observations tell us, the future is going to be quite grim, actually, um, because in approximately 140 billion years, everything will have moved away from us and we'll simply be left with our nearest neighbor, uh, uh, possibly just us, uh, uh, that we can see uh, because of the expanding acceleration of space. So that's a little bit uh, disconcerting perhaps. So let me end then um, uh, by just repeating uh, that uh, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, and I think, this, uh, I think this is true for everything I've said. And I'm not sure we have the extraordinary evidence to be really confident just yet of much of this. So, but I think it will be coming in, in the not so distant future. So, thank you. stars moving up and down in the Milky Way, and figured out how much mass was needed 
to uh, force them to have orbits that came back again. Okay. Um, and so that gave him an amount of mass um, in, our, in our neighborhood. Now even that amount of mass was probably was more than he thought he could see directly by counting stars. So even for all, there was what he called a, a dark matter problem. But he resolved it in terms of saying, well, maybe they're just faint stars, they are dead stars, whatever. So it was not a huge problem. So the difference now is that we can go out to the edges of the galaxy much further away, and there the orbits of the stars are, are non coplarian And that, so that doesn't contradict these vertical motions in the center. That, that's all fine. So the stars in our neighborhood are moving in Keplerian orbits? That's or? right, yes. Okay. Uh, how ancient is dark energy? Uh, that 70%, was that uh, the same ratio of uh, dark energy to matter uh, immediately following the Big Bang? Or did it arise later? Is it in a fixed percentage? Well, it, it's, it's just a constant. So early on, it was completely irrelevant because everything else is so dense. Mm -hmm. right? So it's just today, the density of the matter drops. This constant suddenly comes into its own. Mm -hmm. So now it's dominant. But it's only been dominant you know, for about half, half the age of the universe. Before then, it was, you know, very strange. But was, it, was, it, was there a fixed amount of it? And there was a fixed, yeah, a fixed density, a fixed amount, if you like, for a fixed volume. that probability could be very small though, that's the problem. I mean, um, because um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the constants, uh, what we call constants may not be constant. You know, you have, the laws of nature are one thing, okay? So, you know, some people even worry the laws of nature may not may vary from place to place in, in, in this month, okay? But forgetting putting that aside, the constants of nature, there's no reason to think that they're really constant. For example, if we go into string theory, which is one theory at the beginning, then there are more dimensions than we're used to. And as those dimensions um, disappear, which they do very early, they, they leave behind different values of the structure, all the constant nature. So any, any region might have different values from some other region. So if you have a large enough universe with many, many possibilities, then sure, somewhere it'll be OK. Um, but um, and we can sort of try to estimate how small that probability might, might be. And it turns out that there are enough places in the multiverse to hide all the other places, uh, we think. Otherwise, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be here. That's one way to look at this. Our presence is somehow a proof that this did occur. That, that's about the only real solid piece of data we have. Um, is, um, is God um, um, solvable? <laughs> well, again, if, if I were blaze for Pascal, I would say, yeah. But I can only quote other people on that one. It's a question of faith, obviously. But I think I did have one slide on this, actually. Sorry. Show you. Um, okay, so, so this is um, the, uh, you know, so there is, of course, one reading uh, of the, from the King James Version, which gives us an age for the universe. Um, a poll was taken in the US about um, uh, how many people believe in this creationism, and it's apparently 50%. I don't know what is in Canada, no idea. But and then, of course, when um, they did this in the UK, uh, um, well, and then the, 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 there was a famous um, incitement issue by Price and I, pointing out that you know that it was fine to have one's model of the universe, and that uh, that was totally distinct from one's faith in, in, in God or whatever. And then, uh, as far as the UK goes, uh, <laughs> this was <laughs> More Britons believe in God. <laughs> in regards to dark matter, this is the first time that I've heard somebody attribute exclusively to 
the particle. Regarding dark matter, it could be an endless series of possibilities. Now, if you're convinced that it is a particle, the most viable candidate is a supersymmetric particle. Yeah. For the longest time, that was viable, but with the failure of the Large Hadron Collider to detect supersymmetry, this is what I would ask you. Supersymmetry was originally, originally developed as a solution to low energy physics, especially, specifically the gauge RF problem. As the decades went on, it was found that supersymmetry would be applied to a wide range of other physics problems. Now, supersymmetry seems to be off the table as a solution to low energy physics problems. It's still very much active for high energy physics, such as dark matter. But my question to you is this. When supersymmetry was originally developed as a solution to low energy uh, physics, now that the large hadron collider has failed to detect the lightest ones, it seems to be off the table for low energy physics problems. Therefore, do you consider it to be viable to continue to search for supersymmetry as a solution to the dark matter? Yes, I, I disagree with that because uh, you know the discovery of the Higgs uh, was already um, at, at, you know 125 GeV was a surprise. It wasn't expected to be there, and there were already forces into a somewhat artificial state of fine tuning. And so to then go and say that the fact that we haven't found some symmetry yet, uh, simply by pushing it to a slightly higher energy scale, is just a little more fine tuning. And these are fine tuning factors of um, parts in a thousand that. Uh, insignificant completely compared to the dark energy problem I talked about. So, you know, I regard this as minor, very minor fine tuning, and therefore one should look for supersymmetry at the TV or the 10 TV scale, and uh, the only solution for that is to build a, well, perhaps a larger light. So that, that would be, you know, my view. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. Yeah, you said we need a new Einstein. But um, the problem is that um, in any discipline, um, not just physics, any discipline, if somebody proposes something very radical, the establishment usually um, um, finds it difficult, very, very difficult to accept, and that's been that's pointing it kindly. So um, how, so if you were a new Einstein were to come along, how would you recognize a new Einstein vis-a-vis -vis someone who simply has wrong ideas, and um, and and um, would would you if that matter you you are the establishment you yourself might well um, reject the ideas of the new Einstein um, even though you may be correct. I'm just wondering you know, your last words. Right. No, I think I think that's that's very valid that, that old issue. Let me give you an example um, which is quite close to home actually. Loop quantum gravity. You know, that's you know, been touted as, as the solution to quantum gravity. I, I, I think it's failed completely because there are no predictions that come out of it. The same is true for thing, string theory, too. So eventually, it may take time, but eventually there will be predictions and confirmations by experiment. And then I think then people will you know, line up behind the, the new view, the new paradigm. That's what happened exactly with Einstein, right? Um, I think precession, advancement of Mercury's precession, precession was one thing that was fine, but it was really the um, uh, looking at the total eclipse of the sun and seeing the shift in the stars that made you know gave him front page headlines as you know the, the new theory. That, that 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 was a clear shift. So I, I think we have to wait for you know, some such uh, development, you know, following uh, some proposal of the new theory. Thank you.